Let's take a look at IKEA's smallest USB power supply, which is also called Smahagel, just like its triple outlet brother or sister. And uh, this, depending on the country, you'll have either the connectors will come out the side or they'll come out the back. In the case of the UK, we've got our big chunky square pin plug and it comes out the back. Now, it's notable that this thing is only rated. At this point, I have to say, this does not fit in this way. I'm going to have to turn it upside down. This thing is only rated about one amp at five volts because it's actually designed for powering low power devices but ikea say it's one of these things just plug it in and leave it in all the time it's uh, perfectly safe to do that so here is a suitable tester let's zoom down in this so you can see the digital display better so currently displaying seven milliamps holding 5.03 volts i'm turning it up it's rated for one amps maybe i'll just turn it right up to oh, over one amp it's still holding at 5 volts at over 1 amp, so let's keep going, and I'll use the finer control, 1.1 amp, 1.1, five, still holding 5 volts, 6, and it cuts out. So see 1.16 amps, and then it cuts in and out. Okay, that's reasonable enough. It is just designed for things like little lights and things like that. I shall zoom back out again. Or no, I won't zoom back out. I'll just stay where we are. I'm not sure how easy this is going to be to open. Is my usual brute force approach of ramming something in here and then trying to force it apart going to work? I don't think this is going to come apart in a controlled manner. I think it's going to be broken in the process. I shall try putting these in here and prizing apart. If it doesn't come apart easily, and IKEA stuff doesn't come apart easily, not unless it's the, the furniture, uh, then uh, I'll just pause. In fact, you know what? At this point in time, I mean, I'll try the spudger. Where is the spudger? I've misplaced the spudger. There's the uh, spudger. Isisamo. Uh, let's try it in here, but is it, I think it is, really tightly sealed. So I don't really hold up much hope for getting it open like this. One moment, please. I'm about to get destructive. I have cracked the seam. And now it is open. Let's get it out. Oh, look at the big isolation slot there. That's quite impressive. Um... Things I'm seeing initially, there's a little inline fuse. There is a couple of input capacitors with uh, filtering a little inrush there, Mr. by the look of it. That's quite surprising for a little power supply like this. I'll zoom down a bit. Uh, there is the transform with super duper extra separation going out. And this, that could be one of those little polymer capacitors. This looks like a bootstrap capacitor. That looks like a MOSFET for it. Where is the chip? that controls this. It's probably that little dinky chip there. Right, you know what happens now. I shall take a picture and then we can explore the circuitry. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. It's quite a nice design. It's got some nice features, uh, particularly structurally, because if you take a look at this case, it's got this big L plate in it. That goes through the isolation slot in here to provide an extra barrier against, well, flash. It's also got a, a decent lip round here and also tracking. Um, that also is augmented from the other side of the connector. It's got this plastic plate covering the electrical connections. Decent heavy gauge wire. That is so unexpected in, in these things. You, you get so used to the crappy Chinese ones. Let me zoom down a bit. That you expect super flimsy wire. This is wire rated uh, for handling fault scenarios. There is also this little tab here, and this tab presses down behind the USB socket to provide extra mechanical reinforcement. So I would guess that's partly for plugging stuff in and out. Also, it's worth mentioning that the socket doesn't just have the tabs at the side, but it also has a central pin going down to provide extra strong, rugged mounting for the plugging and plugging of stuff from that. Very good. Uh, things worthy of note. I'll give you a brief summary of the circuitry and then go straight to the schematic. Uh, we've got the live come in, goes through a one amp time delay fuse. The neutral comes in and goes through a 05D100 NTC inrush limiting thermistor. What this does, it starts off with a slightly higher resistance, limits the inrush current as these capacitors charge up, and then under load, it will warm up slightly and its resistance will drop, so it won't uh, limit the current too much. The number on it is 05D100, that breaks down as 05, that's the diameter, D, it's a disc, and 100 
just that a resistor color code one zero decimal multiplier one zero and then zero is a multiplier so effectively it's just 10 uh, ohm i measured it at 12 ohms but which, which is fine um there are two capacitors death beam capacitors and an inductor between them plus a little sneaky surface mount inductor in the back a super well insulated transformer with the uh, secondary brought out on a separate port with that thick insulated uh, winding and then a little capacitor over here for the um, bootstrap circuit and on the other side we've got the uh, a polymer capacitor I think uh, 560 microfarad 6.3 volts that should be super 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 long life it is super uh, circuitry wise biggest surprise here was this transistor here I had to take it out to test because I thought that was a MOSFET. It's not. It's an NPM transistor. One designed for switching uh, ballasts. Um, so like the old fluorescent lamp ballasts are finding new uses for that transistor in uh, neat little power supplies. We have a dedicated chip uh, which is marked uh, 2Y3I or 2Y31. The usual stuff applies. We've got the filtering, we've got the snubber network across the primary, we've got the sense resistors, that little control chip, the transistor, and then the sort of feedback circuit and the bootstrap. On the secondary side, we've got a traditional Schottky diode with a snubber across it, which is good. Uh, that makes me think of Hive, or was it Nest? Can't remember. Which was on Google one? Anyway, the ones that uh, the diode blew up all the time, yeah, that, the snubber would have prevented that. Uh, and then it's basically got that uh, polymer capacitor, a little 5.1k resistor across that as a sort of passive load just for stability when it's not got uh, a load plugged in. And then a little uh, decoupling capacitor and the output to the, MOS, the USB port via two resistor dividers to provide a particular, particular signal on the data pins. Let me bring in the schematic and then sneakily. Well, nobody notices drawing that extra one that I missed, that 5.1k resistor. 5.1k resistor. 5.1k. That's that little extra shunt resistor that just provides a load that stops a voltage across this capacitor creeping up too high when there's no load and the, this unit is just pecking at the output just to keep it awake. Um, the incoming supply... Well, let me zoom down this. I really have to zoom down it. There we go. Make it fit. Uh, incoming supply. There's the one amp fuse. There's the little NTC thermistor that is so cute. Uh, bridge rack fire and then a 4.7 megafarad 4 volt capacitor through a tiny little surface mount inductor. I wonder what that was initially. I'll show you. It's uh, that little black thing there. L2. Uh, that is that little surface mount inductor. There is the main uh, through-hole component inductor for filtering. And then it, initially when you power it up, it charges this capacitor, which is the power supply capacitor for this chip. It charges it via this MOSFET, which is by default turned on uh, naturally. Uh, and that charges via the 300K and 150K resistors. And once that has reached the threshold at which that capacitor has reached the threshold voltage that the chip starts running and can therefore create its own power, it shuns this, it turns this uh, MOSFET off so that those resistors aren't active anymore. Quite interesting. That will reduce the power dissipation slightly. Also, it's supposed to have advantages of running high voltages across resistors, but uh, that's not such a huge thing. I think it is purely the tiny little power saving that it adds to it. Once it's running, you've got a feedback winding uh, that provides power via 2.2 ohm resistor and a diode to that capacitor. And you've also got a little feedback network, network and decoupling capacitor that then signals back to the chip so it can see a mirror of what's happening on the secondary side so it doesn't need any fancy feedback. It's all done through the windings. Here's that uh, 4243 DM. NPN transistor with a built-in reverse diode across it. Quite neat. It's being driven directly, so this must have a current limited output. Normally with these circuits, I think it, I tend to think of it as being, you know, a MOSFET, but uh, that's interesting. I have to keep an eye out for that in future in case I see other ones using a similar thing. There are two 4.7 ohm resistors that when this transistor turns on, current flows through the primary and puts a magnetic charge into it. They sense the point at which the, uh, the current reaches a certain threshold. And then the chip will sort of turn that off. Um, when it does, 
the slight, before this section can cut in, you sometimes get a spike across this inductor and it's shunted via this diode, a couple of resistors to that capacitor that just absorbs that and then this resistor here gradually leaks that away so it's ready for the next spike, it's the snubber network. Um, there's a class Y capacitor between the two zero volt rails, zero volt, zero volt, but they're completely separate zero volt rails. This is about 350 volts ish. It's actually, I think this is universal voltage. I think it runs from, I don't know, where is it? I think it is a hundred to looking, looking all over for it. A uh, hundred to 240 volts. So it is universal voltage. So that could be quite a wide range of voltages. But the current is covered across. As the this turns off, the magnetic field collapses, and that's the point that this little diode diverts it through to this polymer capacitor. There is the little snubber network because uh, short key diodes, although they're very fast, which is our main advantage, are very bad at dealing with reverse voltage spikes. So they've got a little sh uh, shunt across that, a little uh, snubber network that just absorbs any sharp transient spikes. Uh, that is what killed those thermostats, those uh, Google thermostats, not having that. Um, there's another little decoupling capacitor, then there's that little shunt resistor, and then there are the two voltage dividers that feed the USB output, and that is it, fundamentally. It's a very straightforward design, but a nice design. It is exactly what you'd expect from IKEA. It's uh, designed to high standards. Uh, particularly the uh, separation, the casing, it's nothing like those junk ones you get off eBay and Amazon that are just electrical death traps. Some, so I always recommend, if you're going to get a USB power supply, get it from somewhere like IKEA, because then you're going to be, any. they have a reputation to protect, they have standards to comply to, and uh, their standards are high, and it's safe. It's uh, ideal for charging your electrical stuff. But there we go, USB stuff. That is it, the IKEA Smohagel mini charger, rated at one amp, five volt output. It's a very nice power supply, as expected from IKEA.